Hi everyone, my name is Sharna Bache and I'm a senior here at Royce Prep School. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, before we get started, I'd like to touch on a few points. Webinars with content like this one are one of the first steps that we must take to repair over 400 years of pain and suffering. You're here with us watching tonight and that is half of the battle won, but the hard work relating to anti-racism still continues. Our jobs are not done after watching one video or reading one book. As it's, a, as it's a never ending process of learning, healing, restoring, and redirecting. The purpose of our webinar series is to shed light on vast world issues, issues after that affect our Roycemore community tremendously. I hope that through these webinars, we are adding perspective and providing you with the tools that you need to broaden your horizon. No matter what skin color you are, we each hold an equal responsibility and opportunity to build unity, justice, and restore, and restore what racism has broken. It's not fair nor appropriate to depend solely on people of color to educate those that are unaware of what's going on and fix these issues alone. So many people of color have had to push through feeling uncomfortable and navigating through white spaces for their entire lives. And this is also something that they continue to do each and every day. So while it may be hard to understand the differences and educate yourself on the issues due to the fear of feeling uncomfortable, I encourage you to do so. Push past those feelings and do the necessary work as we're all in this together. And we have to make a change starting with ourselves. Thank you. With that being said, let's get started. Our first panelist that we will be hearing from tonight will be Bessie, um, our first question for her is, women are, are minorities, but women of color have a different experience than some of the other minorities. Some people even say that women of color are at the bottom of the food chain. What is it like navigating through white spaces that aren't made for you to succeed as a woman of color? How can inclusivity and equity change the experience for women of color? Great question. Um, thank you. Thanks for inviting me, first of all, to this panel. Um, very interested in hearing what everyone has to say tonight. So to answer your question as much as I can, um, and again, I'd like to paraphrase what you just said, which is um, one part of what you just said. We are not the voice of everyone, so my perspective is not the perspective of other people who look like me, but I can share my own personal perspective as a case in point. But, um, and I, of course, I have other friends around me who have similar experiences. But again, I think it's important to realize that no one person is a spokesperson for all people. And I think a lot of times Black people find ourselves in the position of being spokespeople for the whole race. And that's not fair and it's not accurate. So to answer your question, um, I have had to navigate a lot of white spaces through school. Um, my major was chemistry and English. And so I was always, as a chemist, around people who didn't look like me. And there is that sense, um, as, um, I guess it's uh, called imposter syndrome. And so you do have that where you feel like, should I really be here? People around me don't think I should be here. What am I doing here? And so it really takes a lot of strength, a lot of resilience and working through those feelings and recognizing that you are worthy and you should be there. And I would say it gets better with age. Um, over time, you do start to build up that strength. You have your support system and your family and friends you start to recognize your own worth. And so as you do get older, you do start to have more of a sense of being able to overcome that obstacle quicker. But every new space poses a challenge. Every time you encounter a new situation, new group of people, you sort of start from scratch with proving your, your worth. And so it's just this constant ongoing thing that we do where we have to just kind of push through a lot to get things done. Um, as far as um, how equity and inclusion can improve the experience for Black women, one thing that comes to mind of just an example, when I was in grad school, I had a group of friends and they actually, some I was close with and some not so much, but they all decided to do a group problem solving session and they invited me to join this group. And so we would make up problem sets for each other and we'd have to you know, solve the synthesis challenge. And it was interesting because I was brought to the table, not as a oh, here's someone who needs some tutoring help, but here's someone who's an equal to this. And so bringing people to the table, not as a guest at the table, but as a co-owner of the table is really important. And so in this particular case, we were all making problems for each other and solving our problem sets. And so it was really interesting to have that sense of not only was I learning from them, but they were learning from me. And as we all know, the more you teach, the more you learn. And so a situation, 
allowed me to gain confidence in my ability to solve these types of problems and also to create problems for other people to solve. So I think that again, bringing us to the table and recognizing that we are supposed to be there. We are very worthy and we bring so much. Thank you for that. Um, our next question is, can you tell me about a difficult time when you have advocated for diversity, equity, and inclusion? Why are these things so important? And how do you push through? How do you push through when you feel uncomfortable? So um, let's see. There was a time in June, sometime in the summer of 2015, where I saw a Facebook post about how there were there's a big controversy in the town that I lived in at the time, and I was out of the country, so I wasn't in town for this, but there was a big controversy because there had been a building that had housed the all-white public library, and it was called the Confederate Memorial Public Library. Over time, they moved that location, they had a regular library, and the, uh, that was open to everybody, it was no longer all-white, and the words Confederate Memorial stayed on the building. And there was a push to remove those words because in that building was now a museum that was supposed to be for everyone. And it was very off putting to a lot of people to see Confederate Memorial, myself included. And so I had always assumed that that was a museum about the Confederacy and I didn't really anticipate ever setting foot into it until I had to chaperone a class trip and I found that it was just a regular museum. And so when this um, movement came about to remove those words, I decided that even though it was one of these situations where yes, I have roots in North Carolina, but not this particular area, and a lot of the animosity was the sense that these out of towners were coming and erasing the history. And I decided to lend my voice to that movement. I wrote a letter to the county commissioners offering support and just explaining my perspective as someone who was really off put by those words and what it meant to me, how much it really affected me every time I drove past and think that my town has this flag of basically hate. And I just really was uncomfortable with that building. And so Time went on, I came back to the States. Um, this is now July and they had the vote. I was able to attend that hearing for the county commissioners to vote on this issue. I got to the parking lot, huge Confederate flags everywhere. And I was like, oh my gosh, I hope I'm gonna be safe in this place. Um, but I went through this hearing and I sat through and I was there to support and they did vote to remove the words. And in doing so, it just made me feel like they wanted me to be part of this museum and other people who look like me to be part of it. And so the museum director and I ended up becoming good friends and she's this wonderful, brave woman who was getting so many threats and people showing up in the museum to intimidate her. And she just really felt strongly about making this an inclusive space. And so she invited me to join the board and I accepted and I got to, and working with her, put on so many events that were multicultural, that were far reaching, that you know pulled in authors who lived in the local area, who pulled in artists. It was just a really, very inclusive um, situation, much more so than had been the case before. And so more people who looked like me joined the board and we just became a much more inclusive um, museum that told the whole story of the area, not just one piece of it. And also wasn't a situation where people didn't feel like they wanted to be involved. So you had local residents who lived in the area for many years who would bring their family histories. And it just became a very, very community space as opposed to this place that I just kind of like, oh, what is that? I don't want anything to do with that spot. So I think that there's a lot of value to that. And the push through is just, the end result is worth it. You know, it was, it was a little nerve wracking for me every time I was in the space. So I thought, well, what if one of those angry people, the flag wavers come and do something while I'm here and then my family is without a mother. And it just, all those thoughts run through your mind. But I also felt like this is important and I'm just going to stick it through with my colleagues. And we did, and it ended up being a really wonderful thing for the local community. That's amazing. Um, I just realized that I didn't introduce to you where I'm sorry, so I'm going to do that now. Okay. Um, but that's okay. Um, so Bessie leads the parent committee of DEI at Roycemore. Um, she's a parent to two children at Roycemore as well. Um, she is very educated and like STEM and history as well. Um, she's served on a lot of boards. Um, and has a lot of experience with race and um, just social justice in general. So yeah, is there anything that you'd like to add to that? That's, that's excellent, thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I've been very happy to be able to pitch in when I, where I can and where I can at, uh, at Voice More. And so the parents, social justice, equity and inclusion, it's been really nice to have that group come together and, I look forward to seeing what else we're going to do. Well, thank you for everything that you've done and all you guys continue to do. Um, 
My next question for you is, you are a parent to two children. With the summer that we've had with police brutality and injustice, what was it like for you to be a parent of two Black children during this time? Is there any advice that you would that you can provide to parents as it relates to understanding the Black experience? Yeah, it was challenging. Um, the news is very challenging. And um, when you have your Black students, Black children looking at the news and wondering what it means for them, and you're trying to put it in words and try to make them comfortable, but also let them be aware of the reality of what's going on, it's a challenge. Um, and I think it's, I hear sometimes from parents that say, you know, I. My child is too young to talk about race. And I feel, well, my child doesn't have the luxury to not talk about race. They notice things and they pick up things. And actually, your child does too, because even though you may think that you're not talking verbally about race, little things you do if you have no friends who are people of color, if you don't ever go to events or occasions where you interact with a person of color, or when you do, if you're uncomfortable, your kids are watching all that. So really young kids, very young kids are picking up on so much that even if you think you're not talking about race, you are talking about race with them. So I think the smart thing to do is just to get ahead of it. Educate yourself, first of all, do some reading, find opportunities beyond, it's not, no amount of training and reading is going to really supersede a lived experience. So read, definitely read, but also get out there, get in the community, get active, interact with people who may be outside your comfort zone to interact with, but just learn from. And I think a big thing when it comes to that learning piece is to be accountable. It's one thing to say I've been trained and I know how to spout off all these wonderful phrases, but if I don't put it into action, then I really haven't learned anything. And if I see a situation and I'm not speaking up, then I'm not being accountable. So again, the training doesn't really do anything if you don't actually put it into practice. Um, I've been, you know, with, uh, it's interesting now that a lot of people are learning about the talk that Black parents have with their kids. And we just, it's, for me, watching other people learn about the fact that this is something that I have to do is an interesting phenomenon because I do worry about my kids. I worry about my adult son out in the world. I worry about my two younger kids out in the world. I worry about somebody seeing them and misinterpreting something that they did. I worry about myself. And so, um, and I think my kids have gotten to see a lot of that. They recognize the fact that when we got pulled over and they were in the car, I did all the things I told them that they need to do. They thought they saw me put it into practice. They see me come home when there was a time I had a traffic stop. It was just sort of a routine license check. And my pocketbook was in my trunk. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've got to go to my trunk. Oh, I've got to get out of my car. And the fear that grips you, but you also have to have a smile on your face and make sure that your hands are all visible. Like all those things you have to put into practice. So I got through that ordeal and got home, but they could see that it had shaken me because I was worried. What if the person flinches and thinks I'm not getting my pocketbook or get, you know, just and you start beating yourself up. Why is my pocketbook in the trunk? What was I thinking? I should have had it up here with me. And so all these things happen. And then we have to reverse in my particular family where my husband is white and my kids know that he has never, ever been pulled over for anything ever. And so that's another conversation that we have to have. And so I think it's just important to be upfront with your kids to just let them know what's going on, not scare them, but also make sure that they are aware. Because the last thing I want is to have them out there unaware and something happens that could have been avoided had they known better. And I'll just, one quote I um, always, I runs through my head all the time, it's paraphrased, but Elizabeth Stone basically said that being a parent is to decide to forever have your heart walking around on its own outside your body. And that's what it is because you worry about your kids and you worry as all parents do about the future you're gonna leave to, for them. But in many cases, in my case, I worry about making sure that they're here to experience that future. So just being aware, being empathetic, being open to new things. I'm gonna plug this book just because I really think it's really wonderful. I finished reading it and I'm gonna donate it to the Royce Moore Library because I really think it's a great um, sort of inside look. It's called The Black Friend on Being a Better White Person. And he does a really great job of just walking you through some of the things that you just maybe completely over your head and you're like, oh my gosh, I've done that. I didn't realize it. It's not preachy. He talks, he writes as a friend telling you sort of, here's what's going on that you should probably know. And so again, I'm going to stick this in the Royce Moore Library. You guys feel free to check it out and read it. And yeah, that was a lot, but. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you. No um, our next panelist is Brandon. Um, Brandon is a Royce Moore alum. Um, class of 2016, and um, a recent graduate from Northwestern, um, class of 2020, and 
yeah, studying psychology, minors in theater and human communication sciences. Um, I'm really excited to hear from you. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add before we get started? No, that was perfect. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, my first question for you is this school year has been far from normal, especially for students of color. A lot of black students are feeling uneasy in their school, work and everyday life, life experiences, excuse me. What advice do you have for students of color that feel defeated, burnt out and tired? What can allies do to support their friends or students? For sure, that is an excellent question. Um, I think first, uh, students of color or marginalized identities, you should prioritize yourself, right? You know, the upheaval of systemic racism and oppression doesn't, does not rest on your shoulders alone and like, nor can it be undone in like one day, right? These are things that take time, but we, we have to keep, you know, remaining, we have to remain persistent in our pursuits for these, uh, for this justice, right? Uh, you know, if you're tired or worn out, you know, take a break you know, sleep in, play that video game you've been wanting to play, uh, read a book, you know, take that break, recalibrate, uh, and then get back to achieving excellence in any form, right? Um, and then I would say second, uh, for especially for, for students of color again, especially BIPOC, you know, there tends to be this like tokenism effect to whatever space you kind of inhabit, right? And so when you're, when you're navigating like primarily white spaces, um, this can be very frustrating and tiring. So, you know, as if you're, 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 you're not like, a, and I think this Bessie t touched on this as well. We, you know, you yourself are an individual. You are not the monolith that represents whatever marginalized identities that you inhabit, right? And so you are a unique and wonderful individual. And so like, with so much more to offer than that. So like, I also think it's really important that you remember that, you know, your presence in these spaces and you know the, the the space you take up is like extremely valuable and important. And I think you you should we should always sort of have that kind of mentality when we enter these spaces. You know, your voice is valuable, your opinions are valuable, et cetera, et cetera. And then the third, I guess, addressing the allies, you know, of all levels. So your peers, teachers, parents, everything like that. You know, it's it's essential to to use your like active listening skills. You know, those things you learn way back in kindergarten are really relevant right now. Um, you know, when marginalized students are talking, you, you, you should please just take the time to listen to them. You know, they are navigating spaces that can cause them great harm, um, and especially to their own marginalized identities. And so when they speak on these issues that they're seeing, we need to listen, then create a dialogue and then take some form of, you know, action to address their concerns. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, our next question is, how do you feel about representation in the education system? Why is it so important for students of color to be recognized and given the opportunities that they need to prosper in their specific ways? For sure, for sure. Um, I, think, I think, as you mentioned in, your, in my introduction, I attended Northwestern University, which is a PWI or a primarily white institution. Um, Upon my entrance to NU, I believe at least 10 or 11 percent of this whole student body was black or Af or black or, or identified as black or African American. And I think by the time I left, we only made up about 7 percent of the student body in total. So, you know, especially for high schoolers here, I think the truth of the matter is I've realized or from my own personal experience, you know, as you continue to further your education you start to see that greater lack of representation and diversity and it varies per you know your field of study uh, and it can be staggering in said fields. I, I can only really speak to my field so I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a psychology hopeful. I'm still very young and having to do more school but um, you know according to the APA and I think just 2015 only about five percent of the mental health care workers in the workforce were black and that's everyone. So that's from clinicians to like the academic professors that take up those spaces that need, you need to then, you know, that, that have to that serve as the representation of people and students for me, like students for me, uh, or like students like me to look up to, right? So when you when I go into this field, I'm hoping to see people that look just like me. That's 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 encouraging. And so like, you know, as I got through Northwestern and everything, you know, I got to my higher level psych classes and clinical psych classes and everything like that, you know, 
I was ending up in giant rooms of 200 plus students and I wasn't seeing, I was maybe seeing five students that looked like me, five other black students that looked like me. Um, at a certain point, you know, at least within, I think psychology tends to be a female dominated field. You know, I didn't even see other black males that looked like me or you right. So I, I was very, I was alone at those higher level classes and, you know, 200 plus students, me and my one friend in the corner, just kind of commenting on the fact that, you know, these are, we're, these, this is the next generation of clinicians. You know, I think you, it's very, it's, it's very important for black students, you know, to be recognized and given opportunities because representation is like essential in all fields, especially medical and clinical work. You know, we should be like, we should look like the population we're serving. I think that is something that is so important. And so when I look at those spaces that I had at the final ends of my like, you know, undergrad, undergraduate career, I'm like, wow, there's a lot of white women ready to serve within the clinical space, but there isn't a lot of either black men or maybe very few black women. And, you know, that's noticeable, especially because I do know like Northwestern is a notable school for turning out clinicians and social workers and whatnot. And so it's like, you know, when you take those people and put them into underserved places, sometimes that can be more damaging. And we, we need to take note of that, right? So, and then also, you know, simply seeing as a child, you know, simply like seeing that you have, you have more worth than just trying to become, you know, the next hip hop artist or a basketball player, because that's where you see your representation, even in Disney movies, you know, um, uh, it's like, as long as you can see that representation, you're, you have the capacity to imagine yourself in those scenarios. If you're a Disney princess, to a basketball player, to a doctor. As, and so and if you see those things as a kid, you can aspire to them because it seems tangible, it seems feasible now because you've seen someone do it, right? Um, so, and I think the last note, I'll really kind of think about that or just leave for people to really think about, you know, um, how to gain access to these sort of systems. Cause we have to really think of, I like to take a look at things from like a systemic approach as I've probably said multiple times now, but there are, we have to recognize that there are plenty of systemic barriers in place that prevent marginalized students, especially BIPOC from attending, you know, fantastic universities from succeeding in like things that you just assume would be natural, the natural course of life, right? And so you all are currently, I don't know the exact audience, so parents and students alike, you know, you, you're all attending a wonderful school that is able to provide you with like so many opportunities, but you know, that isn't true for uh, many children within the public school system, right? Um, I think the easiest bar barrier to sort of recognize when we have these conversations is definitely monetary, right? To succeed at any level, regardless of like academic talent, you need some money, um, you know, it costs money to take the ACT or ACT. It costs money to, you know, to have student prep for those tests. It costs money to take AP tests and send them to colleges. It costs money to, you know, apply to colleges. I mean, it, you know, it's, a, it's a, for me personally, it was $100 to get rejected from Stanford. Um, so like, these are hefty prices you have to pay, right? And so when you start thinking about sort of the resources that our marginalized students have available to them in you know, more, more uh, non, like not as privileged spaces and are lucky spaces to like Royce Moore where you, know, you can get funding, you can get fee waivers for things. You know, there's plenty of like uh, FAFSA and other things and things that exist that you can use for resources, but there, there is a distinct difference between you know, having to seek out that resource. That, that's where the privilege really, really lies, right? Where we have to distinctly seek out all of these resources to then have a chance, right? And I think that is where the, the, the equaling of the field and how we can you know, really help black kids achieve great excellence in all forms, right? That is, that is kind of how we should approach these issues. And, and monetary is just one form of, a, of many barriers that exist within a systemic system, right? So. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, our next question is, some people are not able to assist students of color and cannot interact with them comfortably. What advice can you provide them with? To be, to be fairly blunt, I, I think we, we, it's, it's a situation where you have to get used to it. You know, marginalized groups and students of colors aren't going away. <laughs> um, we, I, I feel we should be doing everything we can to make these spaces safe 
accessible and accommodating for them. Um, we should make sure that they can like exist and perform to the same levels of the peers by removing as many of these systemic barriers that I had mentioned before as possible. But then it's like, you know, and I think uh, Bessie and also I think China also touched on this. It's like, I, I gotta emphasize, you know, we gotta use our active listening skills here. You know, I have to have, you have to start having these conversations with these students. Um, but you also have to remember, uh, it's not the responsibility of the marginalized student, right? To explain their trauma to you. That in fact tends to be more traumatic for those students to have to regurgitate all of the things that they have dealt with over the course of, honestly, most of them very young lives, right? And it only accumulates over time. And digging up that sort of trauma and having them explain that can be very damaging to students, right? So Google is kind of free right now. So that is definitely a good resource. Um, you know, if you feel uninformed about a subject or you think it might be touchy, you know, please just 10 minutes of your time, 10 minutes of your time. And Wikipedia is like, honestly, a fairly good source of information. So, you know, very much uh, one of those things where you gotta listen, but also you have to know when to kind of do your own research and you wanna act, remember, I think we also touched on this again. You can't just be, to, to fight racism, you have to be anti-racist, right? There's no such thing as just being like non-racist or complete, because then you're just complicit within a system that benefits you. And I think that's a difficult conversation for many to have because, you know, um, uh, at multiple levels at different types of the system affects you differently, right? Depending on your marginalized identities and et cetera, et cetera. System can hurt you in different ways. But, you know, for certain marginalized identities and when you start stacking those marginalized identities on top of each other, things can get very difficult, and very hard for students. So I think it's one of those things where if you find yourself in a position where you don't really think you have a lot of marginalized identities that you really identify with, maybe. you learning about other marginalized identities so you can at least try to be empathetic of, scenario, of student situations, I think is definitely a first step in sort of getting comfortable with these scenarios with the students. Thank you. Um, our last question is, so many people believe that blue lives matter. The police should not be defunded and that all lives matter, but why do Black lives matter? As a nation, why is this our focus right now? Okay, uh, <laughs> so, uh, how I put it? So I, I think there, I haven't been in Mr. Hunt's class for a long time, but I believe there's definitely a logical fallacy that I can kind of think of right here, you know? And I, I think that, you know, the, the argument, uh, all lives matter, the blue lives matter scenario. I think there's a, uh, at best, you know, that argument's probably ignorant. And then at worst, you know, it's being made in bad faith intentionally. And what I mean by this is, you know, claiming all lives matter as a response to saying, for someone saying black lives matter is I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I haven't taken a hunt class in a long time, but as a straw man fallacy, you know, where uh, they are attacking a position that nobody holds. Um, <laughs> No one, I, like, you know, it's easier to attack the scarecrow made of straw than to actually attack a person, right? So, you know, it's like no one would ever say all lives don't matter. No one would say that. Um, I think the argument when, you, when we're talking about Black Lives Matter is it's more so, you know, as I said before, and as I think everyone's probably going to reiterate in various ways, right? Uh, addressing systemic issues that create barriers for marginalized students, you know, especially VIPOC, right? And so like in this country, black lives are, are valued less than their white peers. And there's, a, there's just a plethora, a plethora of you know, data that points to various barriers that make it difficult for black students and black people in general in this country to succeed. And so that needs to change. And so the only way you know, we can do that, we, 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 we're, my bad, the way we must address that um, so that all lives mattering can be achieved. So there, there is equity within every, you know, within, within every race, within, within, within every art, uh, identity. Like, so that is kind of like a, that's kind of where I stand on the sort of all lives versus black lives matter scenario that I, I often hear being brought up on the internet and the Twitterverse and everything like that. But, you know, and then to touch on, I think he's like the, the defunding of the police, right? I, I, 
I think a lot of people get get caught up on that word defunding. I don't know why. I'm surprised defunding is you know as is as culture controversial as it is. Um, I, I I've in my spheres I, I will I will preface that I think Northwestern's a fairly liberal school, so take that as where my 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 leanings of political might align, if you will. So I will be fully transparent with that. But it's 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 you know and I've heard more calls for abolishing the police, right? So I think to just address, you know, defunding the police, we need to recognize that pe people are specifically talking about, you know, the creation and financing of community resources, right? Rather than funding the police, you could fund schools, fund creations of after school programs, you know? Um, I, I know, you know, it's a, it's a thing where it's like, you're talking about, they can't get up to trouble if they're doing something is I think something that a lot of you know, black parents talk about and other people talk about where it's like, if I get my kid in all these after school programs or, or activities, they can't get in trouble. So collectively, if you fund those activities, they give them more spaces to exist in, right? Um, fund men community mental health resources, et cetera, et cetera. So when we fund these community-based programs and grant resources to like underserved community, then you notice that, you know, the police intervention becomes a little less necessary, right? Um, I think the a prime example of this was, uh, if I'm correct, there's a program in Denver, right? Denver, Colorado, the, the STAR program, I think kind of like support team assistance response. You know, it was just a van and it was a medic and a clinician. And in the span of six months, you know, they got like 2,500 calls within their like purview of answering for emergency response. They like were able to take over 748 responses and none of those responses needed any police intervention, right? They were able to address drug response, drug emergency responses and mental health crisis responses. And so, you know, I think at the most basic level of when it comes to defunding the police, it's more so about funding other, other things that could help, you know, the underserved communities that tend to be over-policed, right? And there's plenty of evidence that shows that if, you know, there's less danger for police officers if you have, you know, they're not having to respond to everything. There's less stress, less interaction, everything. That, that is like, I think, a positive. Um, and then more social workers and clinicians can be used to respond to much less dire responses and they can leave the law enforcement, the specific emergencies to the police officers that they are trained to handle. You know, they're not really exact, they're not exactly trained to you know, handle mental health crises, and I personally do not count, um, you know, the five-minute or five-hour seminars they may take on what may be the best methods of de-escalation in those scenarios. But I, I feel like you know you should leave that to someone who's done training in social work or clinical psychology or anything like that that can handle those situations better because they've been training for years. Um, and so, I also think on the point of defunding the police, I, I'm also very much anti, you know, militarization. Of our police systems, you know, it's it's like who are we fighting? <laughs> are we fighting? Are we fighting? Who are we fighting? These communities they serve because that is that is kind of that that's not solving the core of these issues, right? So once again, you know, we don't need to be militarizing the police when we could be adding, you know, mental health resources, right? Um, uh, I'm trying to think about what else. Why well, is that our sort of focus right now? And I, I think. Uh, last piece being, I think we as a nation have to, or we were, as due to the pandemic, we as a nation were forced to kind of sit down and learn and learn about Black folks' trauma. We were for the pandemic sat us all down in our houses. All we could do was look at Facebook and what was our Facebook streams filled with? Violence towards Black bodies. That's what existed. And that's what everyone had to confront with, you know. It wasn't just George Floyd, there were so many more. And it's just like, you know, until we kind of recognize that this country, you know, we exist on stolen land built by stolen people. And until we confront that, we are going to see the cycle and cycle again until I really don't know. It just more, the, the, the point is uh, the trauma that exists throughout having these cycles over and over again only serves to hurt marginalized people.
And that is, I think that is the uncomfortable history we have to really recognize and start teaching at a young age um, to really make sure that we don't keep repeating so many mistakes. But uh, yeah, that's all I can say on that issue too. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, our next panelist is Jose. Jose currently is a librarian, a children's librarian um, at the Oak Park Public Library. Um, he has a lot of degrees, a bachelor's degree from UIC in Latin, Latin American studies, um, a minor in African American studies, um, and also has a master's degree in history at Roosevelt University and a master's in library and information science from Dominican University. Um, is there anything that you would like to add before we get started? No, no, that's, that's, that's good. That's good enough. That's enough degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, my first Thank question you for, for you is, oh, no problem. Thank you. My first question for you is a lot of people do not understand the terms racist, discrimination, and prejudice. Many people believe that people of color can be racist. Oppression looks different for everyone. Can you break this down for us a little bit, please? Yeah, um, first, first, I wanna say um, I'm honored to be with the panelists here, Bessie and Brandon. Um, amazing, Sarah, you know, thank you again for inviting me, China. This is, this is enlightening. So racism for me, of course, um, I guess Bessie, I can only speak for myself. Um, considered to be two elements, prejudice and power. Um, in, in that sense, like, I always thought of, you know, I've been thinking about a lot about racism and, and I understand it as a byproduct of, of a larger, you know, capitalism, you know, um, it's a process of dehumanizing people for the purpose of exploiting and dominating them. Um, and it still is to this day, uh, obviously. To me, uh, capitalism serves more as a power grid, providing racism with, uh, with its dynamic nature because racism is something that evolves, has, has evolved uh, throughout the history of this country um, and the world. So um, I feel that, so prejudice and racism. So I, I do feel white supremacy has, has infected the world. You know, we all have, prejudice thought in our head, in our minds, you know, um, and, you know, uh, but not all of us have the power, you see, to enact it. And um, so there is like, you know, people could be uh, racist, you know, if you're, if you're, um, you could be prejudiced or you could be racist. But the thing I'm saying is that prejudice is kind of like, since we all been infected with it and we all have these ideas and we all, you know, we try to always struggle with it. It's a daily struggle, right? Um, I could be prejudiced towards myself because I have established these like white supremacist standards uh, towards my community, you know? Um, but um, I don't think that people of color could be racist. See, uh, because people of color, communities of color as a whole, don't have the power to, for instance, gentrify whole communities. You know, um, we've been gentrified, uh, but we don't have the power to gentrify other communities. Um, we haven't been able to, uh, and, uh, you know, enact the, the institutionalized racist terror on white community, um, nor I think we, I mean, even though, uh, you know, throughout history, there's been plenty of reason to do so because of the violence enacted upon our communities. Uh, we don't, that's not, um, that's not part of us. You know, that's not what we do. You know, that's, we don't have that power to even try to, even if we want to. Um, so, I do believe racism uh, is, is definitely the, the biggest piece of it is the power piece. And, and how do we look at racism? In my opinion, the big, the big question is how do we prevent racism from harming us? Um, I, I could care less. In other words, what are the 
prejudicial ideas in people's heads, but I do care about how do those ideas, how could those ideas could possibly harm me, harm our communities, you know, um, institutionally, through mob violence, you know, these things are, are um, I think it's a very important question, very critical question, especially um, if, if we're looking at um, allies, you know, if we're looking at allies, if you're trying to be an ally to communities of color, um, I think it's an important question to ask, how do you prevent racism from hurting these communities? What are the institutions um, that we could reform or get rid of? that bring upon uh, racist oppression in our communities. Um, in other words, how do we survive? You know, how do we thrive? Um, th those are important questions for me. And so, and that's my, that's to me, that's the biggest difference uh, when we're talking about, a lot of people confuse um, racism with prejudice uh, and and it's important to understand that power dynamic and where that power comes from and how is how does it function? How do people get dehumanized and why do people get dehumanized historically? And we know it's for exploitation and oppression. See, um, especially in the African-American community, the history of dehumanization um, through, also, through all avenues of media, um, you know, just, in general, just living daily life, the process of dehumanization and how people get dehumanized um, in order to justify, you know, a certain amount of oppression. Um, in the, in the uh, Latino community, similar, similar things. I mean, um, a lot of people don't understand the differences between various uh, Latino communities, you know, um, we're just one thing, right? Um, we're called illegals. That's a form of dehumanization to further oppress people and exploit people further. Um, creating powerlessness and dehumanization, that's what racism is about. That's what racism is about. Thank you for sharing that. Um, our next question is, how do you feel at staff meetings as a BIPOC? Many BIPOC feel like they cannot speak up in meetings or in the classroom even. How can staff meetings or classrooms be safe spaces for people of color in general? How I feel uh, in staff meetings, um, as, as there's times I feel isolated, um, anxious, anxious, awkward, uncomfortable. These are things um, where I work and my immediate team, I'm the only, uh, well, let me see. Well, no, actually I'm the second person of color now. Um, oh, correction, I'm sorry, third person. No, we, got, we, got to, we got it to three now. Um, so, but I haven't really met with all, everybody now, you know, because of the pandemic and as a, as a team, as a staff. Um, but, um, for me, I, I felt these things. I felt like a lot of the issues they were discussing were not, um, issues that I felt were pertinent to, um, what I wanted to do in a sense, um, I was something that I always had to bring it up. Like, and then I, and there's this thing where you always bring it up. And so you become labeled as that person that always bringing up these racial and political issues, you know what I mean? And um, so, you know, there's like this thing where, what, what are you reading? You know, we go around asking what we're reading, you know, people are reading, you know, Harry Potter, other people are reading fic, you know, this uh, fantastical fiction. And I, and, and I'm over here talking about some type of like nonfiction, political, like how to de-police society and stuff like that, you know? So I get labeled, you know, you get labeled. And so um, sometimes that, I don't know, it, it, it's, it's a form of dehumanization as well. Um, you take away that person's dynamic interests. Um, I think for me, everybody's situation is different. Everybody's work area is different. Everybody's you know, work situation is different. But for me, what I've tried to do is um, challenge it, um, challenge it by, by bringing together, by talking about these issues, but not just talking about these issues, but going ahead and as, as a library, doing programming around these issues and doing that consistently um, and connecting with other 
people in my work area on on um, collaborating. You know, this whole collaboration um, is key. Um, and and trying to set the trying to reset uh, an agenda um, on a different basis completely. You know, um, I do remember and, and kind of an example I have that is when, when I was working together uh, with um, bringing consciousness to communities about the original Rainbow Coalition in Chicago and how different people, um, you know, poor white and the uptown communities and the um, Puerto Ricans in Lincoln Park and uh, um, and and African Americans in Austin, the Black the Black Panther Party, Young Lords and the Young Patriots, how they came together. You know, to build coalition politics, you know, uh, in the city of Chicago. And I and I was trying to, and I was, and I actually completed a series of events at the library a couple of years ago. Because one of the goals I have is to present that dynamic nature, you know, um, of coalition politics, but also um, the dynamic nature of uh, different cultures and how they how they affect other cultures. You see, because a lot of people will box you in. You see what I mean? And they want to box it. This is African American history. This is Latin American history. This is, you know what I mean? And my, I'm really into, and I think that how it really happened is that, and it continues to happen, is that there's like this in like this, like this swirling around of influences that we don't ever get to hear about. You know, we don't get to hear about the fact that um, enslaved people escaped to Mexico. You know, we don't get to hear about these coalitions. You know, with um, John Brown, barely get to hear about John Brown. We don't get to hear about these these um, these 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 connections, right? Historical connections that I think will help us today in our struggles, right? Um, and so, uh, one of my I find myself a lot of times busting those stereotypes, wanting to bust those stereotypes, you know. That's what I find. And I think I find myself in a position where I could do that, you know, um, that that would be my strategy. I like to bust those stereotypes. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, our last question is actually, sorry, I lied. Not our last question. Um, the next question, correction, is what is wrong with saying I don't see color or I'm not teaching my children to see color? So. If you're saying, depends on why you're saying this. Uh, are you saying this because you don't believe racism exists? And that's a problem completely that I don't even wanna deal with that. Are you saying it because you're, you know, deep in your heart, you really, that is your strategy to get rid of racism? I believe in efficiency and I believe the best way, and I believe in efficiency in anything I do, right? I wanna be efficient. And I believe that when it comes to this issue, if you really wanna get rid of racism, if you really want to get rid of it, then you need to understand how racism works. Okay, you need to understand um, the, the, the journey of racism from the beginning to now, where we're at now. And that's actually the best way to recognize and understand how racism works is probably the best way, the best tools you could provide to actually reach your goal of getting rid of racism. If that's your goal, if you're saying that because your strategy, in my opinion, is flawed. If you feel like that's how you get rid of racism by not seeing color, um, because uh, it, it unfortunately doesn't work that way. You know, unfortunately, it doesn't work. And I, I think that also um, one thing is I feel like you can't have like you can't have gotten gotten rid of racism and not have gotten rid of exploitation. That I don't, I can't even imagine what that even looks like. So we need to think deeper and where these things come from too. Um, Thank you. Um, now our final question is: A classic part of the modern American dream is to attend college immediately after high school, finish a bachelor's degree in four years, and immediately find a job. But between the cost of college of the high commitment it takes to complete. Many students are, are unable to finish a degree in four years or may not even be able to attend at all. What was your experience navigating through the college process and journey while being the first gen and et cetera? What advice can you give to students that are listening right now? Well, my, my situation 
Uh, my parents, uh, my, my father had a second, has a second grade education. My mom has a third grade education. They were born in the mountains of Puerto Rico. And when they came here, my dad didn't know really how to read or write. And my dad, my mom had some education and she taught him when I was in kindergarten. I remember she was teaching him how to read and write. Well, I was learning how to read and write. My dad was a welder. Um, we weren't very affluent. Actually, we weren't fluent at all. <laughs> Actually, at the time, I didn't know that. But we weren't very, you know, we, we struggled a lot. Uh, but one thing that um, my parents provided us was um, they always told us that we had to get that we had to get an education. Like they always understood the value of that. Like you need to get an education. And they were always on us about that. And so when, when we went to college, we were the first people to, my brother was the first one to experience college. I learned from him. Um, but um, um, so I did, you know, my, my, my uh, I, did, I did take advantage of a lot of grants. We lived, in, we lived in public housing and they actually had scholarships through CHA, uh, public housing. Uh, I remember those, those events. Um, <laughs> and, and so there's also a lot of grants that we took advantage of uh, during my first, you know, my, my, uh, my undergrad years, I didn't have any, um, any loans. I didn't take out any loans. I had a grant, I had grants. So I was, I was, felt, I felt fort fortunate well, because of our economic condition. And I did go to a school that wasn't as expensive as, well, my brother went to, he's, he's still paying loans, but I think that in terms of going to college and stuff, it depends on who, you know, it depends on what you want to do. It depends on, I mean, if it, I don't know what people say, people's situations is different. Um, some people may not um, be uh, wanting to go right away. Maybe some people want to do um, trade schools. Maybe some people want to take, uh, you know, it, 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 there's a, a, lot of, a lot of different situations in people's lives, you know? But one thing that to me remains constant and what, is, what was drilled into my head and I, and I see the importance of this now is that whatever you wanna do, whatever you're gonna do in your life, you have to give back to a community that allowed you to do that because you didn't do it on your own. There's a community that allowed you to do that. Um, and so, and, the, and that very community is waiting for you to say, what's up? What, what are you gonna what are you gonna supply us with now what did you learn out there how are you going to go back to the question how are you going to prevent racism from harming us now what kind of knowledge have you have you provided you know, what are you going to do in our communities you know everybody's profession you could do something whatever you try to do whatever you learn how to do whatever so that's kind of been my thing you know um if i want to go back to school which i think i'm doing you know it goes back to that it goes back to like what am i going to do this that's that goes into my um decision process like okay I get a degree in this but why why would I want to get a degree in this how am I gonna how am I gonna like you know turn this into something that I could give back to uh the communities I'm in you know that's so important to me whatever you want to do I don't care what you what you do you know I don't care but it has to be something that um that your community is waiting for you because they allowed you to do that they allowed you to do that Thank you for sharing your story with us and just being so awesome and open. Um, our next panelist is Sarah McGuire, um, who is the Director of Development at Royce Moore, um, faculty sponsor of Yearbook and MSA, um, a mother to two children um, who are amazing. And also she's adopted a lot of children along the way at Royce Moore. Um, is there anything that you'd like to add before we get started? Yeah, I first just want to say, I want to say thank you to Jose and Brandon and Bessie uh, for your labor tonight. I know that these kinds of things are things you are asked to do over and over again to educate people like me. And I understand that. And I, I just... Um, sorry for the technical difficulties that we're having. Um, I'm also sorry that we're we're going over on time, but I think that this is a very necessary conversation. Um, and time is at the least of our worries. Um, How's that? Is that better? Oh, oh my gosh, you guys are so patient. I know a few people, we've lost a few people, but I'm gonna say this one more time so that you can hear it. 
And this is very hard for me to say. And one of the things that we as white folks have to do is make ourselves vulnerable and make ourselves uncomfortable. And I'm very uncomfortable right now because I love dearly the people that are on this panel. But today I was racist. And that is not the cross burning, sheet wearing racism. That is everyday racism. And it occurred because I saw a black man crossing the street on his cell phone with a knit cap slung over his shaved head. And I have to admit that it was racist because I was watching him to see what he was going to do. Okay. And I missed that there was a tractor shoveling snow on the street I was turning onto. So I had to stop very quickly. So today, China was the last time I was racist. Thank you for sharing that. Our next question is, how are you hurt? How are you holding yourself accountable to the Black Lives Matter movement? How do you challenge racism in your everyday life? So I, I do have a, I am having a bit of a hard time with being able to, to do what Black Lives Matter asks us to do. And that is to put your body in front of the people who are, who are running protests. Uh, I have not been able to do that yet. Um, but what I have done is to continue to say that Black Lives Matter, and I have continued to challenge every instance that I see in myself and in others of, of racism. I'm also accountable to when I'm called out or when I'm doing something that's not cool. Um, and I don't cry about it with my people of color. Um, friends, I don't do that. I, I, I cry by myself because I don't want my t white tears to make them feel like they should feel sorry for me. So um, the second part of the question was, um, how do you challenge racism in your I, everyday life? So that's a bit that I, I think that answers the question a little bit. Um, I am a, a one of the founding members of a group on Facebook called um, Real Talk which is women of color and allies uh, talking about issues of racism and social justice. And through that program, um, which began in 2016, I wonder if you can guess why, um, the, uh, they have provided training for white allies and education for uh, white allies um, and uh, a place for uh, women of color to um, speak. So there's a public version of this group on Facebook. Um, and I would highly suggest that if you are on social media that you search out Real Talk, colon, W-O-C and allies. And that uh, they post a lot of great articles from Medium that people from the group um, deal with. And um, it, it's one of the ways that I, I am able to continue my influence. I have also, risked relationships with family members. Um, and uh, right now is a risk for me to come up here and talk at my job uh, in the position that I'm in about these things. So that's what I do. Thank you. Um, our final question for you is, what has it been like for you in your journey of becoming an ally? What do you wish people knew about allyship? And why is it important to, for people to be allies? Wow. Okay, so um, I thought that I was an ally until uh, I, I didn't understand why Trayvon Martin was killed. Um, so I thought that I knew things. Um, I thought that I was doing good. Uh, I thought that I was a good person. I am a good person. Um, but what it means to be an ally is to become a bit more introspective and to look at your own life and your own uh, benefits of white supremacy and um, systemic racism, because it does not matter how wonderful you are and you are all wonderful. It does not matter how wonderful you are as a human being. If you have white skin, you have benefited from white supremacy and you hold power that you may not understand. So uh, that journey as an ally has been uh, hard and uncomfortable and has, has uh, 
is what I recommend to other people. Read the book that Bessie tells you to read. Do the Googling that Brandon told you to do. Don't ask China to explain racial history to you. You know, these are the things that we need to do on our own. And when we have an education, we can come back and say, okay, I have a question. Am I, am, is it okay to ask you this question? And we have to be okay with our, our BIPOC friends saying, no, this is not okay. I'm not comfortable with this. Thank you. Um, we have, a, we're gonna take a handful of questions. Um, so if you'd like to use the Q&A feature, you can do that now. Um, but in the meantime, I'd like to thank our amazing panelists and all of our participants as well for being so patient. Um, we're really grateful. It's actually a copy of the book right here in front of me. Um, it's also in the chat. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions coming up. Um, so I'm going to take that as we don't have any questions. Um, and that's totally fine. Um, once again, thank you to our amazing panelists and all of you guys for watching. Um, yeah, have a good night.